Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hardy School. My name is uh, Professor Chaksa. I'm an economist uh, uh, here at the school and I teach sometimes actually on that stage. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, which is uh, co-hosted and, and supported by many partnering institutions, which is listed up here. Most importantly for today, uh, the European Union Tax Observatory. And it's my great pleasure to, to welcome many colleagues from the from the observatory uh, who will present today um, the global tax evasion report. Now, tax evasion is a big problem, we think, because empirically, it used to be really challenging to you know, quantify tax evasion. After all, there's no good administrative data or statistics on tax evasion. If there would be, you would probably have no problem whatsoever. However, over the last bunch of years, Economists and other social scientists became better and better in quantifying tax evasion and to some extent in measuring what, what was perceived to be unmeasurable. Yeah? And uh, one of the uh, people who has uh, significantly contributed to increasing our understanding of tax evasion and its distribution along the income, or its distribution along the income and wealth distribution and its role for shaping wealth inequality or income inequality is here with us. It's my great pleasure to have uh, here, Gabriel Sackman. Gabriel is a uh, professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics, co-affiliated co with um, Berkeley, and uh, founding director of the observatory. And in that role, he was leading in an impressive collaborative effort, I think, um, a lot of economists to put together energy to put together this report, the Global Tax Evasion Report. Um, someone who was um, uh, heavily contributing to that, and who is a co-coordinator of that report, is also with us uh, today, Sarah, Sarah Goda. Sarah is a researcher of the, at the uh, observatory and also affiliated with uh, DIW, and together, Gabriel and, and uh, Sarah are going to present now the Global Tax Evasion Report. After that, uh, we will discuss the findings and potential policy implications uh, with you and with the panel, and I would introduce our other panel guests later on, once we are sitting here on the stage. So with that, uh, I would like to hand over. And yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to an interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here uh, today. It's such a pleasure. Uh, to be at the Hertie School to have this uh, conversation with you and to talk about the Global Tax Evasion Report 2024. So as you know, the question of uh, tax evasion has been very high on the international agenda over the last 10, 15 years. And major initiatives have been taken by policymakers to try to address that issue. And sometimes, you know, you hear people say, you know, it's the end of tax havens, uh, you know, grandiose uh, proclamations of uh, progress. And it can be difficult to know what's the reality of uh, the progress made against uh, tax evasion and what remains to be done. And so essentially what we try to do in this report is to provide some answers to these questions, is to take a first global perspective on the, the reality of the progress, or sometimes the lack of progress, made in fighting international tax evasion. It's a report that um, has been prepared by the, uh, by the staff of the EU Tax Observatory, uh, a research organization that we founded in 2021, that's primarily hosted at the Paris School of Economics, that employs uh, more than 20 uh, people uh, today, um, but it, it summarizes not only the work conducted by the observatory, but also the work conducted by many uh, scholars uh, globally, more than 100 percent, uh, more than 100 uh, researchers uh, throughout the world. Indeed, there has been, as Christian uh, mentioned, there has been a renewed interest for the question of tax evasion, for better quantifying tax evasion, and for studying the policies in this area. Uh, in, uh, in the last decade. Um, along with the report, we released um, a new database, which is the Atlas of the Offshore World, uh, that contains uh, some of the key uh, data series underlying the report. 
including uh, statistics on the amount of wealth held in tax havens uh, by residents of the different countries of the world, statistics on the amount of profit shifted by multinational companies to tax havens, you know, how much is uh, shifted to places like Bermuda, like Ireland, and so on. What are the, the revenue losses involved for countries like Germany? Uh, and, and other series on offshore real estate and on uh, labor and capital taxation. So uh, before uh, leaving the floor to uh, Sarah, one of the four coordinators of the report who's going to walk you through some of our findings, um, I wanted to uh, mention what is our long-term objective with this report. And we think it's important to um, to contribute to, to an evolution, which is that we think there is a need for an equivalent of the IPCC, uh, but for taxation. So you all know the IPCC, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, that uh, has made tremendous contribution in, in uh, summarizing scientific knowledge about uh, climate change and, and making it accessible for the public and for policymakers globally. Uh, and, and also at showing very concretely the different path for the future, depending on the choices that we make collectively, okay? If, depending on the choices we make to reduce uh, carbon emissions more or less quickly, here is how global temperatures are going to evolve and so on. For, for, tax, for taxation, there is no equivalent, but there is a need for an organization, in our view, an organization that will take a truly global perspective on uh, tax systems, and on their sustainability. Why do we need a global perspective on taxation? Because uh, it's the only perspective that makes it possible to truly assess the costs of international tax competition, of international tax evasion, of financial opacity, and so on. If you take a, a national perspective only, you're not going to be able to understand the cost of these issues. Why? Because from a national perspective, you know, all countries have something to gain, at least in the short run, some, at playing the, the game of tax competition. And indeed, most countries uh, have become tax havens of sorts over the last 10, 20 years. With globalization, there is the temptation everywhere to offer reduced tax rates for certain companies, for certain categories of taxpayers, for wealthy people, for, for athletes, for researchers, you know, for specific socioeconomic groups, with the hope of attracting a bit of activity, a bit of, uh, of tax revenue, potentially. And from a, a national perspective, it can work, at least in the short run. It can indeed generate some employment, some activity, some tax revenues. But of course, from a global perspective, it's all zero sum. Or in fact, it's worse than that. It's negative sum because this international tax competition primarily benefits uh, high income and high wealth individuals. And so it fuels global inequality. And so it's unlikely to be very sustainable. And if you want to think about the sustainability of our tax systems, if you want to think about the future of global inequality, it's really important to take that global perspective on taxation, on tax evasion, on financial opacity, on uh, tax competition. So we hope to contribute you know, at a very modest level to be sure that it's an evolution that's going to take many years, perhaps decades, but we hope with this report to, to contribute to, uh, to that evolution. So as I said, Sarah is going to present some results and then I'll discuss towards the end some of the uh, policy recommendations we make in the last chapter of the report. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Oh, <laughs> uh, I will start with the first finding of the report. Um, which is that tax evasion or offshore tax evasion by individuals is very likely to have been reduced significantly since the automatic exchange of bank information. And we see in this figure, or this figure plots our, like the blue line is our most recent update of the estimated um, offshore financial wealth which is finan financial assets of households or which households hold outside of their country of residence. 
usually in foreign custodian banks. And we see that in percent of GDP, this offshore financial wealth has remained broadly stable, hovering around 10, 11% over the last 20 years. Exceptions are in times of stock market booms, um, but generally we, say this, we, we see that it has remained broadly stable. And we also plot here in the orange line, we plot the share of these offshore um, assets or ha assets held offshore, which can be assumed to be hidden from the eyes of the tax authorities. Yeah, so before the automatic exchange of information, we could assume that most, oh, sorry, that most of this wealth was um, hidden from tax authorities and was associated with tax evasion. However, since the tax authorities internationally Since um, tax authority have started to exchange information on foreign bank accounts internationally, um, they should know much more about who owns assets offshore. And um, this estimate actually relies on research done by Dan a group of researchers based on Danish CRS data that is data obtained from the automatic exchange of information. And preliminary uh, results suggest that this um, exchange of information has been quite successful in the sense that about 70% of offshore wealth could be covered or was covered by the CRS and can thus not be assumed to be anonymous anymore. So this is the good news. Yeah, tax evasion is very likely to have um, declined by a factor of about three. Second chapter is a bit less optimistic. Here we look at profit shifting of multinational enterprises, which we know has skyrocketed in the end of the 90s and also throughout the 2000s and is still at high levels um, nowadays. The figure here plots the um, estimated tax revenue losses due to profit shifting of multinational corporations. And um, the recent updates suggest that in 2022, we still lose about 10% of global corporate tax revenues due to profit shifting. And this is because um, about 35% of foreign profits of multinational enterprises are shifted to tax havens to avoid uh, paying high taxes in high tax countries. And uh, we have here a marked um, two key initiatives. The first is the OECD anti-base um, erosion and profit shifting initiative which was launched in 2015 with the aim of tackling profit shifting by multinational enterprises. And the second one is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act introduced uh, by the year or implemented by the US in 2018. And somehow we don't really see a reduction of profit shifting after the introduction of these reforms. We can see somehow a stabilization here, which might already be a positive aspect of those reforms but we don't really see a reduction of profit shifting. So against this backdrop, we would say that it's rather bad news that the global minimum tax, which was introduced in 2021 by more than 140 countries, has been watered down significantly since the start of this project. So the global minimum tax uh, is an international agreement which for the first time wanted to set uh, a floor to how low mm, tax rates on corporate profits can go globally. And this can be regarded as a landmark development because so far international harmonization efforts only targeted the definition of the tax base and never targeted the rate, tax rate. In this figure we see um, estimates of the expected revenues of the global minimum tax made by the EU tax observatory. And we started with the optimistic view that a global minimum tax of about 20% could raise around 17% of additional corporate tax revenues, 17% of global corporate tax revenues. However, the decision to choose a lower rate, 15%, uh, instead of 20, already reduced the expected revenue by about seven percentage points. And then in the process of negotiations, further loopholes and exemptions 
uh, were added to the minimum tax so that its bite has weakened much more. Uh, yeah, these um, loopholes include a carve out for substance, which means that profits which are aligned with economic activity can also be taxed at lower rates than 15%. And this might actually be an incentive for multinational enterprises to shift profits to low tax jurisdictions and might thus intensify international tax competition. Then we have another exemption uh, for certain features of the global minimum tax, um, which was specifically designed for US multinationals. So here we have another reduction of the expected revenue by about one percentage point. And the last one, which is maybe the most concerning loophole, is that tax credits will not be um, counted in when calculating the effective tax rate of multinational enterprises. And as a result, it might happen that tax havens increase their statutory corporate tax rate, but at the same time offer generous tax exemptions to multinationals. And this might actually shift international tax competition from rates to tax credits. Yeah, and here our estimate is quite conservative. This might actually have much uh, more important implications in the future um, when tax com the face of tax competition changes. Okay, so to sum up, our final revenue will be only about 5% of global corporate tax revenues, which is quite sobering when compared to what we expected initially. In the third chapter, we look at a different topic that is uh, new forms of tax competition in Europe. And um, this slide focuses on personal, uh, preferential personal income tax regimes which um, uh, become more and more popular in the European Union and which weaken revenue collection and also have adverse impacts on inequality. These are regimes which um, offer tax reductions usually to highly mobile and high income individuals trying to attract or country member states try to attract um, foreign executives, for example, impatriates that um, move their residence to a country and then obtain a tax um, reduction in exchange, like for a couple of years, depending on the regime. And um, yeah, the number of preferential regimes of this kind has increased from about five in 1995 to 28 um, nowadays in the EU. So this is um, a summary of our data that we collected from tax administrations on these regimes. And we see that today about 260,000 individuals in, the, in Europe, this includes also UK and Switzerland, benefit from preferential income tax regimes. Um, and the average tax gain for them is about 28,000 annually. Yeah, maybe just as a last explanation, we have here three different types of regimes. Um, one is the foreign um, source foreign source income regimes, where um, only my foreign income is exempted from tax. For example, um, I moved to the UK and my capital income in Germany will not be subject to tax in the UK. Or we have domestic income regimes, which mainly target executives or certain professions, um, as, such as researchers or sportsmen, and where only the income earned domestically um, benefits from tax reductions. And the last one are pension regimes, which try to attract uh, retirees from other countries by offering preferential um, tax treatment of their foreign pensions. And we calculate that altogether these regimes reduce revenue collection by about 7.5 billion in the EU, which is not such a big amount, but as the tendency is um, towards more and more regimes um, being implemented and the number of beneficiaries increasing, this might become more problematic in the future. And now I hand back to Gabriel. If, if we try to summarize, <coughs> sorry, if we try to summarize the, the main findings of the report, we, uh, the way we summarize those is we say it's like in the movie, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So Sarah covered the good and the bad 
and I kept my favorite topic, the ugly. But just to, to, um, to, to, to highlight a couple of points, the good is that we've made real progress in fighting one specific form of tax evasion, which is the concealment of wealth in, in places like Switzerland and, and tax havens with a long tradition of bank secrecy. And we start with that because it shows something very important, which is tax evasion is not a law of nature. It's a policy choice. It's not like it's a fatality that we cannot do anything about it. For a very long time, people said bank secrecy, if, if, if some countries want to have strict bank secrecy laws, there's nothing we can do and rich people will always hide assets in those countries. There's no progress possible. And the, the, the first chapter of the report shows that this view is wrong. You know, at some point countries said, no, we are not going to accept uh, tax evasion anymore uh, through undeclared bank accounts. We are going to create a new form of international cooperation, the automatic exchange of bank information. And it made a real difference. That's, that's the, the, the good. Sarah talked very eloquently about the bad, which is that multinational companies continue to book profits in tax havens. Uh, subject to very low tax rates. And we thought that we had, had made progress in addressing this, but the agreements we have are falling short. And in fact, are fueling risk, fueling international tax competition. That's really the bad. You know, we are in a period when, okay, it's harder for people to hide assets, but countries are still, uh, and increasingly so, competing by offering very low tax rates to multinational companies, to wealthy individuals, and so on. That was, the bad. And the ugly is the persistently low tax rates on uh, very wealthy individuals and billionaires in particular. So this is what the graph shows here. The graph shows uh, estimates of how much tax the different uh, income groups of the population pay in uh, three countries, France, Netherlands, US. This is taking into account, sorry, this is taking into account all taxes paid at all levels of government. So you just, you know, try to look at, you allocate all taxes to the different socioeconomic groups and you divide that by each group's income. Okay, so P010 is people in the bottom decile of the income distribution. What it means is that these are the 10% of individuals with the lowest income. P10, 20, it's the next 10%, and so on and so on. So these three countries, we've, cho we've cho chose those countries because these are the three countries where there is very good data about that specific issue. It's interesting because these are countries with different levels of taxation overall. Among high-income countries, the US is a relatively low-tax country. France is a relatively high-tax country. Netherlands is kind of in between. In the three countries, all social groups pay quite a lot of tax when you include everything, VAT, consumption taxes, payroll taxes, income tax, everything. But there is the same pattern where effective tax rates tend to collapse at the top of the distribution. And in particular, billionaires have significantly lower tax rates than all other socioeconomic groups. Where does that come from? This comes from the fact that when you're very rich, it's very easy to avoid the individual income tax. Why? Because when you're very rich, it's easy to structure your wealth such that this wealth doesn't generate a lot or sometimes even any taxable income. Okay, and the way people do that in practice is that they use holding companies. So they have investments, they own shares in, 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 in corporations or they own portfolios of securities, but they don't own these investments directly. They own those investments through holding companies and they earn dividend and interest income and capital gains through those holding companies, which are kind of like shell companies. And by doing that, they can avoid the individual income tax. So that's why tax rates at the very top of the distribution are, uh, are so uh, low uh, today. Uh, and in our view, this is really the critical uh, issue uh, 
uh, for the future. We need to make progress in addressing that problem. And that's why our main policy recommendation is to create a global 2% minimum tax on the wealth of global billionaires. So we think that the next step in the international tax reform agenda is going to be exactly this. There's been real progress in fighting bank secrecy, thanks to the automatic exchange of bank information. There has been very little progress in uh, uh, fighting tax evasion by multinational companies, but still an important agreement on a 15% minimum tax for multinational firms. The next step is we have to do something for the ugly, the non-taxation or very low taxation of global billionaires. And you might say, wait, why, why, why do we care? You know, there, there are only less than 3,000 global billionaires. It's really a tiny, tiny population. Yes, but they have a lot of wealth. Uh, that's uh, inequality. They have, to be precise, about $12 trillion in wealth. That's what you know the total wealth column shows, the grand total, $12.9 trillion is the total wealth of global billionaires. And number two, they pay very little. They pay in individual income taxes about $44 billion in taxes so that the effective tax rate of billionaires today <clears throat> when expressed as a, as a fraction of their wealth is only in between zero and 0.5%. Okay, so if you're a billionaire, you pay each year the equivalent of zero to 0.5% of your wealth in taxes. <coughs> Sorry, in taxes. And so since they pay so little, if you create a 2% minimum tax, if you say global billionaires should uh, pay at least the equivalent of 2% of their wealth each year in tax, the revenue potential is quite large. This would generate more than $200 billion in additional tax revenue. And you might say 2%, is it, if it, is it small? Is it big? Well, obviously 2%, you know, it's not a big number, so uh, it's, it's quite small, but also it's just very small compared to the growth of billionaire wealth. You have to keep in mind that since the 1990s, billionaire wealth has been growing on average 7% a year. Okay, they pay zero to 0.5% of their wealth in tax. So it ba taxation barely makes any difference to the growth of their wealth. If they had to pay 2% each year, their wealth would grow only 5% a year as opposed to 7%. 5% is still significantly larger than the average growth rate of wealth for the average person on the planet, which is more like 3%. So it's really not a radical idea. It's not even going to reduce inequality, in fact. It would just reduce the pace of the increase in global wealth concentration. But look, we have to start somewhere, okay? And 2% would already be much better than 0 or 0.5%, and you get $214 billion in revenue. To put things into perspective, the best estimates that exist today suggest that developing countries need $500 billion in additional tax revenue to address the challenges of climate change. Okay, $500 billion. With a global 2% minimum tax on billionaires, you get almost half of that. If you strengthen the minimum tax on multinational companies, you increase the rate to 20% as opposed to 15%, and you close the loopholes that Sarah described you get an additional $250 billion. So you get to nearly $500 billion what's needed for developing countries to fight climate change with just two modest minimum taxes on the most powerful economic actors who are also those who are you know, uh, the least taxed, multinational companies and global billionaires. We think there is some momentum for, uh, for this, in particular for the global minimum tax and billionaires. I like to take the example of the US, where in 2019, 2020, Joe Biden, when he was running for president, he campaigned against proposals made by his opponents in the Democratic primaries for wealth taxes. You know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, they wanted to create a wealth tax, and Biden at the time said, no, 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 we don't need that. And then once he was elected and entered the White House, he put in his own budget as president a billionaire 
minimum tax, which is very, very close to the wealth tax that you know only one or two years before he was uh, fighting against. This shows that these ideas are really making progress at a political level. And indeed, there's a growing number of, of policymakers that want to make this uh, idea of a global minimum tax on billionaires the next key step on the international tax reform agenda. So let me just uh, finish by one thing that's really important, probably the most important idea in all of that, is that we should not wait for uh, perfect uh, international uh, agreements to make progress. Basically, if you start from the premise that we need consensus, that we need global agreements, if you make that a starting point, it's a recipe for disaster because it amounts to giving a veto power to tax havens who benefit from the current status quo. So we're all big fans of international cooperation at the EU Tax Observatory, but we think that international cooperation, it, truly global agreements should be the end point, not the starting point. What's needed to arrive at ambitious agreements is one country or a set of first movers, a set of countries taking unilateral measures without waiting for all countries throughout the world to agree. Um, that's, by the way, how progress was made on the automatic exchange of bank information. You know, in 2009, the US under Obama said, you know, we're not, you know what, uh, Switzerland has to send, uh, to send us information about the Swiss bank accounts of US customers. And if Swiss banks don't cooperate, they will face uh, economic sanctions. And under the threat of those sanctions, Swiss banks agreed to cooperate, and it created a process where other countries said, well, look, you're sending data to the US, so now why don't you send us data as well so that we can fight our, you know, against uh, uh, our own uh, tax evaders. And that's how unilateral action paved the way to ultimately a new form of international cooperation. Um, that's why at the end of the report, we describe all the, the important measures that countries can take unilaterally uh, to uh, to foster uh, change, and I'm not going to explain all of that, all of those in details. And I'll refer you uh, to the to the last chapter of the report. But I want to to make sure that everybody has this important idea in mind that uh, uh, even though the ideal is international coordination and harmonization, the way to get there is first through unilateral action in countries where there is the political will to make progress and uh, international coordination should be uh, the end point and not the starting point. So the conclusion of all of this is, number one, tax evasion is not a law of nature, it's a policy choice. Some policies have been effective, so it's really a message of hope. Others, many others are falling short and yet others uh, remain wholly unaddressed so far, the question of uh, the non-taxation of very wealthy individuals. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, to make progress, what's key is for, su su for uh, some first moving countries uh, to implement ambitious minimum taxes on multinational companies and billionaires to pave the way ultimately for ambitious global agreements. Thank you so much and I look forward to the conversation. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Um, that was super interesting. So, so here would be not a sitting water screen, but like we, we can we can we can mix. Uh, this doesn't matter, uh, uh, really. So, thanks a lot. You want to join us, please? Yes, come up. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, before going into the discussion, I would like to uh, introduce uh, two further guests um, uh, who are joining us uh, here. Um, first, uh, welcome Charlotte Bartels. Charlotte is um, interim professor at the uh, University of Munich, LMU München, and uh, also affiliated with the DAW and is working on, on wealth inequality and income inequality um, and, and uh, struggling with uh, some of the data challenges in Germany. Thanks for joining. 
And uh, Gerhard Schick, uh, Gerhard, uh, Schick uh, was a former member of parliament um, uh, for the Green Party, very active on financial policy matters, very active on the COMEX uh, uh, fraud, and, and still continues to be active on that. However, in a different role as, uh, as the, the director of uh, the NGO Finanzwende. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, yeah, probably to start off, um, to you probably, Will be Germany among one of those first movers that uh, is, is pushing forward, like the US did uh, after you know the Switzerland uh, things? Good evening, and first of all, thank you very much for this excellent and I think politically extremely helpful report. Um, well, there is an important difference. The unilateral action by the US uh, against Switzerland was tackling another country. The bad guys that you wanted to tax were somehow well, farther away. And it was basically a conflict against the Swiss banks primarily. Um, so I guess the political challenge with the proposal of a global wealth, uh, a minimum uh, global wealth tax is higher than that on the bank secrecy of, you know, I'd, for the political process, I see additional challenges. And when I look at the reality in Germany, the most important tax subsidy as published in the official finance ministry's report goes to the richest countries, richest persons in our country, to the richest families. It's the exemption of the billionaires in the inheritance tax. So, and... This is unconstitutional. So it's even worse than the ugly situation you describe. Germany has, since 30 years now, an unconstitutional inheritance tax. And the struggle, it's extremely interesting to watch over three different rounds between our constitutional court and the billionaires, so far, has been won by the billionaires. Which for a democracy, it's a weird thing to observe. And so when you, and even more interesting is that until very recently, when Tax Me Now, a millionaire initiative and Finanzwende and Netzwerk uh, Steuergerechtigkeit tried to create a momentum on that issue, nobody talked about that. So I see an enormous challenge for us when the constitutional court is not even able to fight against, you I mean, it's the highest institution in our country, yeah? um, to fight those tax exemptions. Wow. So that doesn't say that I'm against the proposal. I'm just, you know, looking at the fight we're confronting and perhaps a, a second thought on that proposal with a, a minimum uh, tax for uh, corporations, we started at 20% and now are at 15%. And your estimations are that the 17% additional uh, tax revenue created might end up at six or somewhere. Yeah? I guess we have to start a little higher in order not to end up at zero. Just two, two thoughts for the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So probably on the, on the first, I wrapped that up as no, Germany is not probably going to be a leader, but uh, this is probably my take. Um, Charlotte, you encounter similar problems to some extent, right? Like uh, studying studying uh, wealth inequality and wealth uh, data in Germany makes it pretty hard. And life is pretty hard for you, isn't it? Yes, uh, of course, I, I totally agree. And I, I would first like to uh, congratulate Gabrielle and Sarah on this really hugely impressive and important work that they have delivered. So, um, yeah, I'm studying um, wealth and income inequality in Germany, and I face a lot of data problems. And But I think the most important challenge that I would like to mention here, because it's also related to taxation and the political economy around it, is that we don't really know how rich the people in Germany are. We cannot really distinguish between those tiny, tiny family enterprises we want to preserve in Baden-Württemberg and the billionaires. 
And what I learned from studying top incomes in Germany is that the top incomes generated in Germany are from these family firms and they're hold for, by four people. And they generate millions uh, of euros per year, some of them which we see distributed to the to their as as a, in the income tax statistics, and a lot of them not being distributed to the person, so we don't see them actually. So we don't know how much money they actually accumulate because we have no potential source of of uh, information where we could uncover this. And which brings me to the political economy problem in Germany is that all these what you called straightforwardly billionaires. I mean, we could detect some of them from the Forbes list, of course, but what lies in between those few billionaires that we have in Germany and those top income earners, the top 1%, which is a much larger group, is totally unclear. So what, what is really a motivation of my research for the next years is to try to draw a line. Where do we have family enterprises that are probably not flu um, they don't have enough cash to pay an inheritance at some point and they are really contributing to the local job structure and which are which share is actually this type of persons that you describe that are hiding money internationally and not not contributing to the local public goods by this behavior but here I'm I'm like you said, kind of positive and kind of negative on the same side, um, because we, we had this huge initiative to create a tax institute with a lot of positions to be created before the elections. And after the election, this was cut down to two research, um, like referenten, like not even professorships or our PhD people with a PhD. So now two of, two people have to take the fight that Initially, many more with higher uh, status should have fought uh, to link data eventually that we have to draw the line how many family enterprises we actually have that deserve these extra regulations that we give them and how, how many we have where we just throw away our tax money that you, we could have collected and distribute to, to the broader parts of the population. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. So to, to probably explain that, this is uh, referring to an institute which was uh, supposed to be found at the Ministry of Finance. And actually, we invited people from the Ministry of Finance to join us here. Um, uh, <laughs> and there might be somebody in the audience, uh, but um, but uh, yeah, um, um, this is this is uh, this is uh, the sad state of, of of Germany when it comes to that. Now. Um, Going back to the report and uh, probably again to you know the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so so on the good, um, I was I really found it fascinating uh, to see you know the, the impact of, of information sharing and uh, basically these curves getting down. So one trend uh, that is a probably a detail of the report, but I find it super interesting and probably worth uh, repeating here again is that uh, or bringing up uh, here is uh, essentially what type of responses this triggers. So if essentially cash wealth had brought is, is information reported, that provides an incentive for you to shift into different types of holding your assets, right? So uh, so one important aspect of the report that I found really fascinating was was the role of um, investment in, in real estate. So can you probably elaborate a bit on, on that further? Um, and, and then also, because I think this is also a case where it comes to the real economic implications of tax evasion strategies, because this also is affecting the, the, the housing market, right? So what did you find there? And, and what would you expect for the future uh, when it comes to, you know, think about future behavioral responses where I shift from, from cash basically into buying houses? I'll leave it up to you who takes that or who takes parts. Uh, yes, I can say a few words on this. I think what we've, or what research has found looking at these reforms is that there has been some positive effects of automatic exchange of information, like some repat repatriation of funds, but there has also been a shift of funds to other asset classes. And one that we highlight in the report is a shift to real estate, which in many countries is like ownership of real estate is much less transparent. So in many cases, even in Berlin, we can see that when we want to know who's our landlord, actually, we find a shell company from Luxembourg, which belongs to a shell company uh, from Cyprus. And then somehow the trail ends there and we have no way to find out who's actually behind this. Sorry, Panos. <laughs> 
And um, this is something that needs to change, of course, because some research has shown that, that after the CRS, investment from tax havens in the UK have increased, and that this might be a sign of people shifting their money there. But I think there is, again, an easy solution, and I think people are pushing for this on many fronts now, is that also real estate should become more transparent with beneficial ownership registries or even a global asset registry to cover also ownership of arts, yachts, etc. Just to, uh, just to add very briefly that uh, it would be very easy to include uh, real estate in the automatic exchange of information. So at the moment, countries exchange data on financial income, on interest, on dividends, on capital gains. And we could just say now uh, uh, cross-border real estate is part of this uh, international uh, information exchange. If combined with what Sarah described, which is doing more effort at identifying the beneficial owners of, of the properties, it could address this issue that we describe in the report, which is that indeed it remains possible for people to hide assets abroad, not so much with financial assets, although this is still sometimes the case, but with real estate. And so we have very comprehensive data, for instance, in the case of Dubai, where we can see the, the, the huge value of Dubai properties owned by non-residents, um, and 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 which makes us think that you know Dubai is is Dubai properties are kind of the new Swiss bank account, so to speak. But the solution to that problem is the same solution as the one that was implemented for the problem of uh, uh, hiding assets in Swiss bank accounts, which is just to force an information exchange. Yeah. So. So isn't that the, the sort of, from a policy perspective, uh, and also from an optimal fixation point of uh, view, like a classical economic perspective, isn't that the important next step, such a wealth register? Because once you have that, then, then also your proposal to taxing billionaires seems independently of all the issues on the way there. Yeah, But isn't that the first step you have to take to I move to the second? I, yeah, I think it's a very important question. and, and um, uh, I, I absolutely share uh, what, what Charlotte described about the difficulty at measuring uh, wealth uh, of very wealthy uh, German individuals. And it's not true only in Germany, it's true everywhere. But I think we shouldn't wait for perfect data before we try something to tax the very rich. I think fundamentally, when you create a tax, you also create information. A tax is always more than a tax. It's always also a set of accounting standards. It's al always, you know, uh, a set of enforcement efforts. Uh, it's putting resources to precisely measure the tax base. And so we, if we had a, a, a billionaire minimum tax, we would create a lot of information. It would not be perfect, but it, we would create a lot of information about the wealth of global uh, billionaires. And that would address what is indeed a key gap in uh, uh, existing official government statistics, which is the, the, the lack of data on, on the very rich and on wealth concentration more broadly. It's one of the most hotly debated democratic question, and yet, uh, to know something about the wealth of billionaires, we have to use, we all do that in our work, you know, that data from uh, uh, magazines like Forbes magazine or, or, uh, and, and others uh, in different countries. And that's not acceptable. But the way I view this is that with uh, the type of tax that we describe in the report, you know, governments would at least be able to produce some valuable information about all that. So, Transparency um, would be would be the policy buzzword, I guess. Uh, so, so could one sell that to to the policy uh, audience here? More transparency on the housing market, on the ownership of wealth. Is this something that that seems realistic? Not only in Germany, but but all, uh, you know, from a European perspective. Well, we have seen that uh, Germany was uh, one of the important fighters for uh, country-by-country reporting at the European Union. 
that was a joke. And um, we know how the discussion uh, goes in Germany when it comes to the um, transparency register or a wealth uh, register. Um, the main argument is that uh, it would hand out uh, business information, confidential business information to the opponents, and it's uh, negative in the competition of German multinationals or family businesses abroad. Um, and that there is a personal risk for the, for billionaires and millionaires if their wealth is, is known, is seen in a public register. Um, even so, I, I share the point, uh, without data, we cannot, we had, tax authorities don't have the basis. Um, and uh, I mean, when you look, and this is a very important part of the work for tax justice, is looking at the administration, administrative work that needs to be done. The construction of a shell company in Luxembourg and then in Cyprus, etc. I mean, that describes the work of a tax administrator as an officer who tries to track down what needs to be paid as taxes. So yes, um, a wealth register would be extremely helpful. Um, I know that opposition against it is very strong too. Um, I personally find it interesting that in, in Sweden there is a completely different culture um, where the tax um, you pay is public information, like in a shared flat where everybody knows, you know, who has done the dishes, you know. And um, but I think it will be a long way uh, to go there. Let me add one point um, at this moment. I very much like the idea of an IPCC for taxation because I think there needs to be included the what you know about financial flows a lot more and about development in financial markets. My fear is that behind the good news that you bring, um, there is a, a shift in financial flows so that the amount of wealth that goes untaxed has actually not decreased. Only the share of untaxed wealth in the tax havens we know so far. Because when you look at the financial flows, what you name as the real estate way, I mean, billions have gone into real estate all over the world. So I guess this largely untaxed wealth is a relatively high share of the current wealth uh, uh, on earth. So sorry to water down a little bit the good part of it, but um, that's my thing. We need to bring the financial industry's development, where do they go, where the financial flows, a lot more into the religious uh, analysis of distributional efforts and also in the taxation issues. I have a comment and a question regarding the transparency of uh, such global wealth registers. So, um, for the socioeconomic panel, which is surveyed at the DIW, um, we created a, a list of potentially very rich people using those Orbis data. I don't know, you have probably heard about it. So, actually, every country in the world has a company register where you can look up the wealth of people. Unfortunately, it's only available in a very like not usable way for researchers. So a private firm, I think in Belgium or Netherlands, I'm not sure right now, takes makes the effort to collect all these data to make it available for tax uh, authorities, but also for researchers. And then you pay a huge amount of euros to get this data that were once public back in a nice way so that you can analyze it. And what we did with this data was to create a shareholder ranking for Germans with sharehold shares from across the globe because we could simply by the personal identifier aggregate all the shares that they hold in all companies across the world. And then we, we sent interviewers to disproportionately to one of those wealthy shareholders and were able to actually include uh, many new rich households into the sub data that we didn't survey before. So now I, I was wondering if you ever thought about using this type of data to 
to approximate at least, because they have the private addresses of all these people in this company registers across the world. I mean, to some extent, we probably will lose some of the offshore wells and like some of the financial assets are certainly not captured, but maybe that would be a first step also to, to have a list. You know, you're absolutely right that there's a, there's a lot of information that exists about uh, uh, assets, uh, but that information first is dispersed, and second, it's uh, in the hands of private uh, uh, companies. And number three, it's not used for a comprehensive. Uh, statistical analysis of inequality, or it's not used for tax enforcement. And behind the idea of creating a, a global asset registry, starting with a European asset registry, then perhaps you know, taking, making it global, an idea that we describe in the report, there is the idea of simply saying, look, let's uh, uh, combine the information that's out there, and instead of just letting it in the hands of private uh, institutions, let's use it for the common good. And you mentioned one type of private data, which is this Orbis data on firm ownership. There's another important uh, uh, data source, which is that uh, uh, the ownership of, uh, of securities, you know, of stocks and bonds, of, uh, of portfolio securities, uh, the ownership of all this wealth is also centralized in private registries in institutions that are not very well known by the public, which are known as central securities depositories. You know, they're, they're, it's Euroclear and, you know, Clearstream. And uh, it's not used to create any form of, of, of statistical knowledge that could feed a democratic debate about inequality or taxation. It's just used for, you know, the well-functioning of financial markets. But it would not be very complicated to say, okay, the information is there. Now let's bring everything together and let's just try to do in a more comprehensive manner what countries have been doing for centuries. You know, for centuries, countries have had uh, real estate and land registries. Yeah, that's one of the big creation in France of the French Revolution in 1792. France creates a land registry, which at the time captured almost all of people's wealth because in the, in the end of the 18th century, land and real estate accounted for uh, the vast majority of wealth. Today, a lot of wealth, especially for the rich, is financial assets, it's shares in companies, it's stocks and bonds. And so we just need to extend the land and real estate registries that we have to those financial assets, or to put it simply to to, to adapt institutions that already exist, that have existed for centuries in many countries, to the reality of wealth in the 21st century. I very much like that thought. We can observe that in Germany, the Grundbuch, uh, our real estate register, used to be a very valid information as uh, you could know who owns the house I live in, basically. And uh, the government had complete information of who owns what. Today, the Grundbuch, because of all those shell companies, has completely lost the informational value it had 50 years ago or 30 years ago. And so it's the question, and I think this is important for the political debate, is not to acquire information in new manner and we want more. No, we want just to regain an informational situation that we used to have. I think this would also be an important, like, a promising way of framing it, right? Yeah. Because uh, this is, this is, I think, not, not, not so clear, at least in the German debate. You know? yeah. I'd have one question uh, concerning the, the tax evasion industry. Um, pardon me? I, uh, sorry, I, I, I just wanted to add that yes, we want the same level of information, but we would like to have it machine readable. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because of course, currently yeah. uh, researchers working on real estate in Germany have to literally go to the offices and ask for the information. It's not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I just had a, a question of curiosity. Um, so far. I make a comparison. In, in financial markets, we use banks a lot 
to obtain information on what's going on. Also, Clearstream has to give information to BaFin, to the financial supervisor. Until now, we don't use the consultancies, the big consultancy firms, the legal advisors, the same way. We don't force them to give that much information to government authorities as banks are forced to give information. And I also, in academia, um, my impression is that so far we have very little knowledge on those who gain helping the evaders. And we don't tackle them. I always like to would like to, to go more on them. Um, my comparison is, or case in point, uh, is the Cum-Ex scandal. I think Anne Borhilke, the Attorney General, does a lot against tax evasion these days, and her colleagues in Frankfurt too. For the first time, the head of the tax department of Freshfields one of the leading international law firms had to face or has to face trial. That was a shock for that world. They never thought they had a legal risk. And that's why I think the consultancies, perhaps we should have a closer look at those. And from LuxLeaks, uh, for example, we know how important their role is, but still they have the reputation of being, you know, the, the good guys. And I guess we have to go more on that, uh, on that way. Well, that's a really interesting point that you're raising here. Actually, also I know from Freshfields employees that they directly get offered to have paid out part of their salaries through the Cayman Islands or so. So, and this is then what we would, we would categorize that people when they start their jobs probably as the, like, strict, like slightly below the top 1%. So, what brings me to the, to something that I would like to add from my own findings from doing the DINA series for Germany with Theresa Neve and Stefan Bach, we, we see that the top 1% incomes are actually quite stable if you do price adjustments. And we cannot really tell the story of exploding top incomes in recent years, even although we add uh, retained earnings. But what we see is quite stably the 90 to 99% increase. And a sociologist told me that these are the helpers. <laughs> and this this was a really good term which really resonated with me. To to some extent this is this group is having exactly those people that you were just mentioning. The lawyers, the tax advisors, the consultants that are benefiting from helping those at the top to hide what they don't want to distribute, right? So we only see what they distribute or retain within the firm and what they and the biggest issue that I hear from tax advisors is to create vehicles to to have to create to transform your income into capital gains, which is eventually not taxed at all if you do it rightly. And this 90 to 99 percent, I would really be. I, I try to find ways how we can identify the share of like through professions maybe. Um, of those who are actually helping those top 1% to remain stable in the data so they can increasing, like, have the steady rise in incomes and the middle 40 and bottom 50 don't see these income gains. I guess there's, there's some economists who would call that a, a positive spillover, actually, but uh, let's not get into that. Um, yeah, so, I, can, sure. Can, can, I, uh, can I just uh, echo what, what both of you said? Because I think it's it's really important. And uh, uh, it's the, the critical importance of the tax avoidance, tax evasion industry, the, the facilitators or the helpers. In fact, I think what studying tax evasion over the years, that's the main lesson or perhaps one of the main lessons that I, I, I draw from, from my research is that most tax evasion is not like people waking up in the morning and being like, I want to evade taxes today. It's it's not sometimes some some people are like that. But most cases is uh uh is more like the supply side of the market, like economists would say. That is the industry that sells, sometimes upsells, you know, tax avoidance, tax evasion services. 
You can, you know, structure your wealth in such and such way. You could create a shell company in Bermuda like your competitors did. Certain structures are particularly, you know, popular these days. Why don't you do that? Or you also see that in the, you know, the Cumex scandals. You know, that's the banks selling customers, you know, specific uh, trading strategies to avoid taxes. It's not the customers themselves who thought, oh, yeah, I could do that. And so... It's very important to understand that because once you've understood the critical role of the supply of tax avoidance and tax evasion services, you also realize that if you want to make progress, what's critical is to regulate that industry better. But it raises all sorts of complicated questions. So for instance, if a lot of tax evasion takes place in very large financial institutions, you know, systematically important financial institutions, they might be uh, too big to indict. As policymakers have been concerned in the past of not uh, putting too much fines on, on companies, on, on banks that had been found guilty of facilitating money laundering uh, uh, or tax evasion precisely because of concerns that it would uh, topple you know, financial markets, it would create financial instability. So when you see things like that, you realize that there are lots of similarities between the problem of uh, uh, fighting tax evasion and the question of financial regulation. And in particular, how do you regulate uh, financial industries when uh, they are you know, very big, very powerful uh, players? So just to say that I think it's really, you know, it's very important to look at things that, that way. You want to come in? Yes, because... Last year or two years ago, I was on a panel with tax advisors talking about how or whether they should be regulated. And they, of course, said, what we do is we help people apply the tax laws how they are. So if this causes trouble, you should improve the tax laws. And then we asked, yes, but aren't those the same people who also help to make the loopholes in the tax laws, which then provides more work for them? And this is somehow true. At the same time, I mean, we saw this uh, introduction of, or the, the fact that the tax credits will not be part of the global minimum tax. And I wonder why, why, where does this come from? And this will, is exactly the loophole in the law, which will create tons of work for those people advising companies on how, or governments of tax havens, how they can restructure their tax code to be still in line with the minimum tax, but still attract multinational enterprises. So there is also this problem of resisting, like why can policymakers not resist in this political process, where of course pressures come from all sides to, to add exemptions and loopholes to the laws, which will then be exploited afterwards. So all important points, uh, and I think you know the legal part and, and, and laws are uh, key here. But one thing we have not covered, and, and that's the last topic before I would open it up to the floor, um, is administration, tax administration. So I mean that report is amazing, but I was really surprised how, how little coverage on, on tax administration is in there. I would totally acknowledge it's difficult to sort of come up with any sort of you know global metrics uh, of, of tax collection efforts and whatnot, but. Isn't that a key part of, of all the problem that, um, you know, adding to the good, the bad and the ugly complicates any of these three? So think about a, you know, a better improved global minimum tax on, on corporations. And then here comes, you know, the German tax administration in, say, the beautiful state of Bavaria and says, yeah, we have this 20% rule, but, you know, we don't probably enforce it. Come to Bavaria. Yeah. So essentially creating tax competition on the administrative side, isn't that a, a key challenge as well? And, and how can we tackle that? Any ideas? Very important. Uh, this, is, this is extremely important. And we talked briefly about some aspect of this towards the end of the report. The, the key thing to understand is that there's a lot of uh, tax evasion which is in a kind of gray zone between uh, legal tax avoidance and pure fraud. Why? Because in the tax law of most countries, including Germany, you have uh, a number of general anti-abuse provisions that say that 
you know, transactions and uh, structures that are conducted or created with the sole goal of avoiding taxation are illegal. And what a lot, you know, when, when, when Google in 2003 uh, creates a shell company in Bermuda to shift billions, in fact, hundreds of billions over the years in revenue to Bermuda, of course, everybody understands that the sole goal of doing that is uh, to avoid taxes. And so if there was a strict application of these general anti-abuse rules, of these economic substance provisions, uh, it would be a very powerful way to curb tax evasion. But, and that's where this addresses your question. There's a political choice to enforce or not to enforce uh, those general anti-abuse rules. There is a political choice. There was a choice that was made in the US, for instance, to let uh, big uh, US multinational companies evade taxes. For a long time, the political choice was, okay, yes, we see, we, we do see the, the billions in Bermuda. Everybody understands that there cannot be any meaningful substance there, but it was not prosecuted. It was not uh, combated in court. For, for various reasons, maybe perhaps for the reason that you described, it was a, a way to make U.S. companies more competitive. You know, basically, okay, we keep rates at 35% for the corporate tax, but enforcement is going to be very lax. You know, you'll be able to shift profits all over the world. And, you know, I, I mentioned the U.S., but many, many countries have made similar choices and all policymakers always face that choice of, of are we going to strictly enforce the spirit of the law, or are we going to allow firms to avoid, you know, to pretend to legally avoid taxes and not prosecute, you know, uh, cases uh, like that? Um, we see that uh, this choice can change over time. So an interesting case is like three weeks ago, the uh, the IRS uh, sent uh, like thirty billion tax bill to Microsoft, saying, "Oh, for many years you've been booking profits." in Puerto Rico, tax-free, there's no substance there, it's tax evasion, you have to pay back more than $30 billion. It was a clear sign of the US tax authorities moving towards uh, a, a, a more a stricter uh, enforcement of economic substance uh, rules. And, and, and in the report, we say that it's very important for countries, for policymakers globally to move in that direction. It's an extremely important question. I would call it an almost invisible fight that goes on behind the doors of a tax administration. Um, political, politically, it's often not discussed. Um, we don't see it. Just to give some hints, um, there is this, a decision in Germany to cap the number of tax, Steuerfahnder, Fahnder in English is which, which one? Is it the auditor? So there's a difference between the normal tax administrator and those who go in the companies and a tax auditor. Um, so they capped in Germany the number of tax auditors. Is that something that is known in the public as the debates? Do, do you find that very much in, in party platforms? No, it's a completely administrative issue. But of course, with that, you can make it difficult to, to really tackle those questions. Second, they reduced the number of trainee positions in the German tax administration in order to starve that administration. So even if now you have a progressive finance minister who wants to increase the number of employees, they just don't find them because for years they were not trained. Um, it's a political choice, exactly, and it has to do with individual persons and their integrity. We have the case in Nordrhein-Westfalen where we could see the Steuerfahndung, so the tax uh, auditors in Wuppertal had a reputation to tackle uh, tax evasion, tax crime, because they had the support of Norbert Walter Borjans, then fin finance minister in that region. After the election, his successor, without doing anything, simply showing no interest in the issue and no support, the three top persons in that administration left to the other side and now help others evade taxes. It's a question of political will, but we will need to bring those issues into the political debate. 
they're today too much behind the doors and there is also a, um, a decided secrecy. There are benchmark lists in Germany, which Bundesland, which region um, employs how many staff, how many additional revenue through tax auditing, etc. This is secret. Even with the normal procedures of information freedom law, you will never get that. And it's by law a secret thing. We have not the right to know how the different regions um, work in the tax administration. And that shows um, how far away we are from uh, at only to know what's going on there. Yeah, that will be uh, a fight. Give, let me give a, a last anecdote that shows um, uh, a problem we have specifically in German with our federalism, federal system. Today's mayor of Hamburg, then finance minister, decided not to collect the COMEX money from that bank. We know he, he knew the case. Um, and perhaps... And I'm probably sure that he's not corrupt. So why would he do that? Well, because it's good for Hamburg. Those millions in a bank that sometimes supports regional foundations and hands out uh, um, money to, to private initiatives and cultural um, uh, uh, activities is more valuable for the Hamburg population than collecting the tax money because a large part of it will go to the federal government and to the other regions. So there is an incentive built within the German system that makes it, that, for, that even for a non-corrupt politician, it does make sense not to collect the taxes of your regional companies. We have to change that. Good. This is going to be the next uh, complicated fight, uh, tax uh, centralization of tax administration. Uh, I, I talked a bit on that. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground, but I'm sure there's, there's many other questions uh, here in the room. So let me invite the audience uh, to come in here and already see here. Uh, hands up. Uh, John, I probably, probably can pass on the mic. Or if you can. Great. So Joanna Bryson, Professor of Ethics and Technology here at Herdy School. Uh, thanks so much. This has been a fantastic panel. Um, I'm, I'm coming into these questions because I've firstly, as just a naive observer of uh, the power that was coming up in the AI industry as I was an AI professor. And uh, I've come to many of these same uh, positions you are, like this concern about how do you bootstrap a, a global <laughs> solutions, as, as you might know, was in the news today, this week with, with AI. Um, and I'm really fascinated by what you said. I bought, well, first of all, the graph that you showed about the billionaire tax, and I think you kind of were saying this, the fact that it looks like all the billionaires tax is at the lowest level, because basically I assume billionaires are totally portable. And so I'm wondering how to, to and then you said something about the global taxation of billionaires, um, which is, again, we're back to this problem of bootstrapping. I was wondering maybe if it was just a 1% tax, but per citizenship, so that each country would be motivated to go after their billionaires if they want to keep their passport or something like that. I'm just wondering about this distributed thing. Um, and then secondly, uh, the, I just really wanted to support what you were saying about the sort of this competence issue with the, con the consultancies. And again, we're, we're hitting that looking at digital. Um, one of the things that I, I, I wasn't clear if you were really saying this is that the um, we're worried that a lot of what governments do, they can no longer do themselves. They've outsourced it to the consultancy, so they're now dependent on that. So that is another reason why they are afraid to attack the consultancies, um, is because they, they need them. Um. Um, I, th thanks, a, thanks a lot. I think a um, very, very important question. Let me perhaps just try to uh, illustrate how it's possible to, to bootstrap global coordination starting with just unilateral action by one country. And let me take the case of, um, of the minimum tax on billionaires. I think the most important idea to understand is, is the following idea. Any country can choose whatever tax rates they want 
Okay, and so any country can choose not to tax billionaires, not to tax multinational companies. Why not? But other countries can also choose to collect some of the taxes that tax havens choose not to collect. That's really important because once you've understood this, you've understood that, for instance, Germany tomorrow could uh, say, okay, we're going to have a billionaire minimum tax for German billionaires. But we're not going to stop there. We're also going to tax foreign billionaires. And I don't think you know citizenship, nationality should matter for all of that. What should matter is we should tax billionaires who derive at least some of their wealth from having access to the German market. So if someone is a billionaire because he or she owns a company, it's very valuable because it sells stuff in part to Germany, so Germany should say, well, look, if you're not paying tax abroad, wherever you live, okay, no problem, but we are going to tax you a little bit because part of your wealth derives from just having access to our market. And there should be a, some counterpart to that. You know, and we already have a number of conditions for market access, you know, number of minimum requirements. And another minimum requirement should be you have to pay a minimum amount of tax. Now let's imagine that Germany does that. It would create a virtuous circle because Germany would collect taxes on behalf of other countries. And then those other countries would say, look, why, why don't we also do that? You know, there's money on the table to grab and we were letting Germany tax global billionaires, but we could do it ourselves. And so you see how unilateral action by one country can create a virtuous circle where, where other countries start collecting their share of the tax deficits of billionaires or multinational companies, and eventually you end up with uh, a race to the top with an harmonization you know, on, on ambitious minimum tax rates. Thank you. There are more questions uh, over here. Let's probably start in the front and there were hands up early on. Yeah. Um, hello. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm a student uh, at Hertie. I just uh, had um, two questions on the same lines. One was um, regarding um, like generally digitizing um, like, you know, just all financial um, transactions because digitization is growing everywhere. Um, I mean, not so much in Germany as I would like it, but, uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, I come from India and it's, um, yeah, we, we use a lot of uh, just digital banking. Um, so one is just digitization and the second is, uh, and it's relation with tax uh, avoidance. And the second thing is uh, the introduction of central bank digital currencies. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not very sure if any country has started with CBDCs, but uh, it's an interesting idea to uh, like just print digitally. So uh, would, what are your thoughts on that um, and tax evasion? And the last thing is with regards to uh, private cryptocurrencies and uh, tax avoidance, uh, sorry, tax evasion, what would, um, you could share some evidence or what are your thoughts on the relationship between these things? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the discussion. Uh, my question. So, any, any, sorry, that, that anybody wants to, uh, to come in on the, on the, the digital traces, um, which is a terrific, tricky uh, topic, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think in my imagination, the really rich people are already doing digital banking and are not carrying around their money in cash. I think this is a valid concept for fighting low-level criminality, drug trade, etc. But I don't think it will be super helpful in getting access or more information on the wealth of the very rich. And this will be mainly, I think, this information we could better get by enforcing reporting by banks and financial institutions. But yeah, important questions now. I think it's widely debated. Probably to add on that, I guess, uh, like like cash using cash as a substitute to to electronic payment is a is a middle class or upper middle class evasion strategy, which is still very common in German Germany. But like quantitatively, it might not be the most important thing. At least that's that would might be would be my take, which is still a problem. But like 
terms of big mon money lost, probably not. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my question relates a bit to the public discourse about tax evasion, because normally, like you would think, the democracy that because you have more non-billionaires and billionaires, it should be easier to combat tax evasion because the interest of people to combat tax evasion. Uh, but yeah, so my question is because there's many people and many voters thinking that actually taxing billionaires more will threaten their uh, firms. It will destroy those companies that has have been family ownership for decades. Uh, so my question would be, where do you see levers in the public discourse to kind of change this? We can look at what has happened um, specifically at the inheritance tax exemption to find out why do the billionaires win, you know? Um, We'll know from the lobby register that Stiftung Familienunternehmen, the main association where the billionaires do lobbying in Germany, spends like two million a year. Yeah. Perhaps a little more. It's not so decisive. So in the last 20 years, they have perhaps spent 40, 50 million. Let's say 100, doesn't matter. In the same time, they saved from the tax exemption, they pushed through with their lobbying, 77 billion euros from 2009 until now. The return on investment of political lobbying is a return you will never reach in any other business. Calculate the return and you will find out that you want to be a lobbyist. And that shows why the billionaires win. They have managed to completely change the public discourse. In the beginning, after the first um, decision of the German uh, Constitutional Court, it was about a fair inheritance tax, about exemptions for the rich. And within months, it was only about the fear of losing jobs because of the inheritance tax. And we can find the result of the lobbying in the polls. People react when hearing inheritance tax and ah, job loss, danger. There are many false, fake information. There is not a single proof, a single example of a company where jobs were lost or the company in danger because of the inheritance tax in Germany. I have asked in any panel where someone said that there is the risk there is no evidence on that. It's fake news. But when you spend billions each year in fake news, you will manage to convince the 99% that they should defend the interest of the 1%. And that's why we founded Finanzwende, to organize the fight back. Um, I would like to add something on a positive note. <laughs> So I really feel that it's also responsibility of research in Germany to provide the facts that you just mentioned are lacking. And in fact, there's only a couple of people who have even used the inheritance tax data that are available for researchers in Germany to study such questions. I mean, until today, we're not able to link them with any other data source, but we are working on that. And we got third party funded money from the German Research Foundation and the Hans Böckler Foundation to hire postdocs to study these questions. So I think on a positive note, there is a movement and more and more people are aware of, of questions like that, that we should actually provide more facts to the debate what is actually inherited, how much wealth is being passed on, and how how do actually these firms behave once they pass on their wealth, and how do they downsize the jobs before they transfer the family business so that they can easier pass this wage test. And we actually got a survey now from the Stiftung Familienunternehmen that they conducted with the IFO Institute, um, where they asked firms if they transferred, uh, inter vivos gift transfer, and we can link them to other data sources. So we are actually 
trying to study exactly those questions to feed more data into the debate. But I would be happy if other people also join us because more voices makes it easier. And we definitely lack just answers on to this lobby in, in idea, ideology because they are free to say whatever they want because we don't provide the data to say the opposite. Yeah, and if, if you compare the, the, the lobbying millions with the few thousand euros being spent on research, the return of, of research is much higher, so we need much more money uh, there. Um, there's lots of hands up. Uh, there was one in the back, but then probably let's move over here uh, to the left. But let's take one question here in the very back. It's quite quick, uh, just the follow up because you said the need to organize, but I would say how, like what do you, what are the next steps that finance vendor wants to take and maybe the others can add as well, because I mean the arguments are there, but I don't see a mobilization for this topic in the public discourse. So I yes, please come in. But like I guess the first uh, step, and, and again I would hear Sikon, my the other panel members uh, to to congratulate uh, Gabriel and the other team people from from the observatory is like reports like these are important for raising awareness at the at the scale which is you know large. But I fully agree with you. I don't I don't see much much mobilization either. And you mentioned before the case of North and Westphalia, where there was a successful policy person that was selling himself with that, you know, I'm tough on and cracking down on tax evasion. Um, you know, it's a shame that we don't see more of that type of, you know, political economy success with that topic. So how can we make that become a success topic? In the case of the inheritance tax, there is a new decision by the Constitutional Court in the first quarter of 2024. We don't know how they will decide, but they picked up the case. So that might open a window of opportunity, and uh, we want to use that. No. What we have reached so far is at least naming the opponent. Stiftung Familienunternehmen is now known as the lobby organization who pushed through these exemptions. And, and uh, until we start, before we started that uh, kind of campaign, they were not really visible. So we brought them to the light. Uh, that's helpful. That's the first step. And um, yeah, we have to use that window of opportunity, but we are dependent on the, uh, the decision by the constitutional court. If they are lax, and allow the billionaires to win again, difficult. If they're tough, we can win the next round. Then would be a three to one. Let's hope for that. Uh, I, would, I would just add that I think it's very important to, to be clear about how you want to change the world and how it's possible concretely. What I mean is this. When you ask people in Germany, everywhere else, whether they think the rich pay enough in taxes, multinational companies pay enough, they say no. If you ask them, do you support a tax on the very rich? Do you support an inheritance tax on the very rich? The vast majority of the electorate says yes. It's even true, you know, in the US, so, you know, not known for the, their love of taxation and indeed a relatively low tax country, but like 70% of Americans are in favor of a progressive wealth tax. There's a lot of polling on that. And the reason why this doesn't happen or too slowly is not that people are convinced by, by the trickle down theories. I, you know, it's bullshit. You've said that. I think, you know, look, look around. Who believes that, you know, not taxing billionaires is going to trickle down and, and taxing them a little bit is vital for, you know, economic activity? I mean, very few, some people do, it's a very, really a tiny minority. However, many people genuinely think that uh, although taxing the rich more is, is necessary, is justified, is a good idea, they think that it's difficult, that it's not going to work if one country does it alone, that in a globalized world, you're going to have tax evasion, you're going to have tax competition, you're going to have you know, enforcement limitations, that there is a kind of fundamental tension between uh, European economic integration, globalization on the one hand, and economic justice, tax justice, tax progressivity on the other hand. 
many people have you know, are con generally convinced. Sometimes these are self-serving beliefs. You know, billionaires will say, oh no, you just can't tax us. And it would be great, but it's just not possible. But most often, these are genuinely held beliefs. And so that's why it's so important to explain how very concretely you can in fact have uh, taxes on wealthy people, taxes on multinational companies that are going to work even in, in a globalized world, even without uh, a global agreements. So we are really running late, uh, and but there's many hands up. Uh, so let's probably take uh, one or two more quick questions and probably let's collect questions uh, and then have a last round here. And then I'm afraid we have to, to wrap up. Please. Yeah, thank you. Hunsdorfer, uh, Freie Universität Berlin. So thank you for an interesting discussion. Uh, one remark and one question. Uh, the remark goes to you, Mr. Schick. I agree that the inheritance tax subsidy is wrong. However, I think there is quite strong evidence, contrary to what you have said, that the inheritance tax indeed costs investment and jobs. It's, uh, for example, I remember by a paper by Margarita Zuzura, Journal of Finance, which is very sophisticated and shows that the inheritance tax is indeed negative for investment and jobs. Um, the question I want to ask is uh, uh, concerning the, the millionaire's tax or the billionaire's tax. Uh, I know how much taxes I pay. I do not know how much uh, how high the tax burden is I have, because there are very complicated questions of tax incidents, value-added taxes, payroll tax incidents, and all that. So I think a tax burden calculation is heavily uh, dependent on the assumptions. And I wanted to ask which assumptions you made for calculating the tax burdens of these uh, billionaires. Thank you. Uh, that, that's for me, I guess. Uh, the assumption is that we allocate uh, all taxes to individuals, and in the case of billionaires, you know, most of their wealth, most of their income derives from the ownership of corporations, and so we allocate all the corporate taxes paid to billionaires. Okay, so you can make other assumptions, but if you make other assumptions, you're going to find even lower tax rates for billionaires. So we are go being some, you know, maximally conservative here. We're going all taxes paid by firms. It's as if they were paid by the firm owners. Uh, yeah, so that's how we do it. Um, good. Probably one last question. There's uh, persons uh, here on the, on the left uh, who's been waiting with her hand up for a long while. Hello, thank you. Lauren Johnston, I'm attached to Sydney University and I study China's economy and I, I wanted to add a comment more than ask a question based on the student in the front row who asked about digital currencies. And I, I wonder if you, and I, I'm not an expert in the technology underpinning them, but I wonder if you underestimate the structural shift that is the digital currency, which, for example, if you look at the way China is currently testing a digital currency and how that operates, it's so much more traceable and so much more programmable than what you might call electronic money that we have today. So, the, you know, the tokens that are embedded into what is a digital currency can be traced almost lifetime for every transaction they make. And the government of China, and this applies to any government, it's not a Chinese technology, the government of China can program a unit of currency to not be able to be spent outside of China. So they can fix domestic money supply and then they can have a different set of international money supply. And obviously this creates a whole different level of traceability and controllability in, in terms of, and, and I think there's only one economy that currently has a full nationwide digital currency test underway and that's the Bahamas. And so maybe the Bahamas, and I mean, there's, but there's a lot of links to US credit cards and even the current president of the World Bank was head of, I think it was MasterCard and MasterCard has a link to this digital currency nationwide test in the Bahamas. So perhaps the Bahamas has new systems of taxation that are not even yet in the consciousness, but around this digital tax, this digital currency based tax. So I just wouldn't underestimate that. And 
if China has new ways to collect tax, which obviously has all sorts of other implications on privacy and so on, if they have a new level of efficiency for collecting tax, maybe that can become a threat that you can use to say, well, you know, like our biggest competitor is able to newly collect all this tax or we can't and therefore we'll fall behind, you know, more or otherwise. Maybe that's a threat that can be evolved over time to help bring tax and to foster the digital currency debate here. So that might be the future, but uh, and from a German perspective, that might be the very distant future. I'm afraid. Um, um, I, you know, you, you might be you might be you might be more optimistic when it comes to digitalization. But having lived here now in that country for 20 years, and um, sh sh sure, Not but you know, like in, invite you to to go out for a drink here in Mitte and and see how many places you can pay in cre with credit card. Yeah, cash only is still a very prominent thing here, uh, in, despite the fact that we're in, in Berlin. Yeah. If I may only do words on it, I, I think digitalization will change a lot, but it's not clear in which direction. It both opens the opportunity in the crypto sector to new ways of circumventing other systems, and it can also be used to combat tax evasion. So digitalization has always those both faces, and uh, we have to make sure it's not going in the wrong uh, direction. It can be a blessing and it can be a burden. Um, but uh, I listen carefully. Um, it's interesting development. And it goes back to the point that I made. We have to include in the analysis of tax evasion the change in the financial system and the digitalization um, the development of cryptocurrencies, etc. That is a major change we have been observing. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to be uh, too too negative on that. But probably you can also frame it as a positive thing. So there might be technical technological changes on top of that that could help uh, potentially, and uh, that's that's certainly one avenue for the future. Before that, however, I, I think uh, the big step forward is that, um, you know, uh, this report brought light to an important topic that where we, I think, all agreed that this is important to discuss uh, also in a broader, broader public and, and, and to contribute to the public discourse on that simply because it's important and it's uh, so far not receiving the attention it, uh, it, it should uh, receive. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, you guys, for, for presenting the, the report. And thank you also, uh, you, for joining me here. And thanks to the audience. I think this was a lively debate. Thanks and have a good evening. And uh, yeah, take care.